Thank you very much. Uh, it is truly a pleasure to be here at OWASP, uh, which is a, a really good outfit. I, I think I usually vet speaking engagements through my marketing guy, and he says, oh, yeah, you got to do OWASP is a great group, and they've uh, worked with us to make some of the materials available to our developers, which really uh, helps us build better software. So I, I don't have, uh, I have an awful lot of good to say about OWASP and nothing bad. So really, it's truly a pleasure to be here. So I'm sure that none of you have ever had cause to uh, hear this phrase, what could possibly go wrong? But uh, I, I'm, I'm not giving a super technical presentation. There are pl plenty of people here, and probably a lot of you who are probably much better technically than I am. But I like to, to talk about this in the, in the context of thinking differently about security and, and, and being able to speak and actually do things differently, because it's, um, what we've been doing so far has not worked particularly well. Oops, I've got to find the page down here. Ah, there we go. OK. Technical difficulties, uh, page down. OK, guys, what do I do to get this to go down? I'm no, nobody here is cleared to see this. Ah, thank you. Thank you. I told you I was technically challenged. There we go, proof point. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why would we even want to do things differently and a little bit about you know, talking, thinking, and actually acting differently about security. So why would we do anything differently? Well, well one of them is. Um, one of the things you learn if you look at almost any, you know, any, any biologic system or military system or anything, you sort of adapt or die. And we actually already know this working as technologists. How many people here know how to program in Fortran? Okay, good for you. I only know that a little bit, and I was a really bad programmer because I'm old enough that I remember paper tapes and you know, the card decks and that type of thing. That's the only reason I know Fortran. So, but most of us have probably, you probably up, upped and revved your skills since then. So we all know that, and we know this certainly in terms of security because there's always new attacks coming out and you have to think about things differently. So we're already sort of having to think about things differently. The other reason is we're building infrastructure. This is sort of one of the problems that a lot of security people have to live with is unfortunately a lot of the people who are building this stuff don't realize it's infrastructure. Whole different level of, of uh, an obligation on dirty of care and resiliency when you're actually building infrastructure rather than, than just some cool little piece of code. Um, the other thing, uh, false prophets and pixie dust, what do I mean by that? There seems to be almost a religious fervor about technology. And, and I like technology as much as the, the next person, and, but, but particularly when you work in Silicon Valley or some of these other places, it's near reverence towards technology. It will cure cancer, it will raise the dead, you know, it will give us eternal life. And a lot of the people out here shilling this view are really false prophets. And they always assume, they never talk about security, they're assuming the security messiah will come along and save them. That you can take very insecure, something that was badly designed, badly put together, never thought about being attacked, and you can sprinkle magic security pixie dust on it and it will all be secure. Which is how we get people building things that are not robust enough and, and creating systemic risk. There actually is no security ma magic pixie dust. I think we all know that. But part of being able to uh, get rid of the messianic fervor is to be able to talk in language that people understand about what the risks really are. There's no, no such thing as no risk. You, know, the, you learn that in business school, the, the relationship between risk and reward. But I'm talking about most humans don't speak Klingon. I, there probably are some people who speak it. Uh, I was actually going to use the example of something that you all probably see fairly frequently and don't know that you see it. So if I were going to say, unless some of you speak Hawaiian, I think Jeremiah Grossman does, you won't know what that means, but it's on the back of the U.S. quarter for the state of Hawaii. It means the life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. But the point is, if I spoke Hawaiian to you, most of you wouldn't understand it. And a lot of non-technical people don't understand geek speak either. And that is part of the challenge for us, because to talk about risk and talk about what we can reasonably do and not do, you can't just walk in and say, well, you know, we need a secure Frappistat protocol. That's the problem. We don't have a secure enough Frappistat protocol. The people who are policymakers, who are users, who are business executives are not going to have a clue what you're talking about. The other reason to think differently about security is, uh, I love the phrase from Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, and there really isn't. There are an awful lot of other disciplines and other, uh, whether it's bio biology, um, uh, medicine, um, military tactics, there's so many other disciplines that have similar kind of problems that we can learn from. Now, for example, you know, why, why do we sort of call a, some of these problems viruses? Well, because of the way that they propagate, very much like human viruses. 
So we already know that there is knowledge in other disciplines, and if we can take some of that knowledge and adapt it to security, we not only might learn something, but we might have a way of expressing the problems that we deal with in a way that non-technologists can understand. In some cases, we might find something quite revolutionary. So how do you speak differently about security? Translation is a really good skill. And one of the things I tell people is, and I work with super de duper smart developers, uh, way smarter than I am in their, in their disciplines. I'm a rotten programmer. Oracle will not let me touch code. Smart Oracle. But I ask dumb questions. I studied engineering. I know I'm a bad programmer. But I know that I can understand technical things if I ask the right questions. So I make people walk me through it. Explain this to me. For example, I have ethical hackers who work for me. And they are really good at what they do. The ones that are the most valuable, in a way, are not just the ones who are brilliant technically. It's the ones who can explain to the less technical, at least in that area, why something is a problem. And they do it without being condescending. You know, good developers tend to get their backs up. No, 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 I'm, I'm brilliant. And, and so to, to be able to explain something to them in a way that is not, you're an idiot, I'm a hacker, and I'm better than you are, which is off-putting. It might be true. It probably is true. But also explain that really geeky how their attack worked in a way that the developer has a takeaway. It's really important, that translation skill. So de-geeking your speak is important. And frankly, everybody... From whether, as I said, whether it's the users up to policymakers, is it has to understand this in some way, so you have an obligation, a way to explain it to them. So I actually am a very good dumb end user. I just expect stuff to work. So from time to time, when we're putting out something as end user oriented, maybe it's error messages, I always volunteer to say, I, if I can't understand this, and I'm a really good dumb end user, what makes us think grandma in Des Moines is going to understand it? So you really have to put things in terms that people understand. And policymakers, you say, why do I keep mentioning that? Because more and more and more, people want to regulate this space. And in a lot of areas, we are being regulated. So at least you have an obligation to policymakers who are well-intended but can't be experts in all the areas that regulate agriculture and medicine and, and uh, economics and financial markets to, to understand what these issues are in a way that they can understand. What are the intended and unintended consequences? We have to have voices at that table, or we're going to be probably be unhappy with they, what they come up with. Not because regulators are evil, but because you have to be able to understand something well enough to understand before you try to write a policy or a law or regulation that affects it. So one of the things I like to do is have good, good analogies and good examples to put things in terms that people can understand. Most of us, well, some of you are probably really good in crypt, uh, cryptology and cryptography and know all the formulas and, and, and bully for you. A lot of it's learned by the old Alice and Bob. And that actually works for me, rather than looking at some formula, even though I, I did take some calculus and differential equations. It's been a long time. So looking at that equation is not going to mean something to me. But when somebody explains Alice and Bob's interaction, ah, great, I get it. Other examples I use, and this one I found very powerful, because frankly, it goes to something I'm going to talk about in a bit, which is systemic risk. You hear over and over again that everybody's getting on the cybersecurity bandwagon. The service academies have cybersecurity specialties now. The armed forces have cybersecurity specialties now. Um, various people, if we need you know, 500,000 cybersecurity experts. It's a booming market. Good for us. We're going to have job security. But when I look at that, I say some of you are solving the wrong problem. So for ex the example I could come up with, some of you may remember the story about the little Dutch boy. So there's a holes in the dike, and he, he valiantly stuck his fingers in the holes to stop the water from coming through the, the dike and you know, flooding everybody out. Valiant little Dutch boy. So the conversations we have seem to be like, if only we had 300,000 little Dutch boys. And look and say, OK, yeah, but if you have 300,000 Dutch boys trying to put their fingers in the dikes to keep, maybe the problem is that the dam isn't resilient enough. And when that dam goes, you're going to drown 300,000 Dutch boys. You're solving the wrong problem. You need to make those, the dams and the dikes more resilient. So you don't need 300,000 Dutch boys. That's the problem. And that seems to resonate with people. Another one that I think about, I kind of laugh about this. You read about people putting, saying, well, we should put our household appliances on a network. I'm aside from everything else, I think the cruelest thing in the morning would be, I'm sorry, you can't get coffee. The network is down. That would just not work for me. I need coffee in the morning. But I also think about the silliness of that. Family of five starves to death. They forgot the password for the refrigerator. 
So, but, but seriously, so well, why are you telling me this? Because you have to put things there. What problem were they trying to solve in the first place? And there are always unintended consequences of this. Uh, another one that I think about, and this, again, probably there will be people who are not happy with me, and I'm not saying that I don't understand the reasons why more utilities and other companies that have critical control systems are making those accessible wirelessly. You know, I think we probably all understand that. I live in a small town in Idaho, and if you have a power outage, it's, it's a big deal. Somebody's got to get out there. So I understand the value of being able to do something remotely to say, well, can I, can I, can I ping that system? Can I help get that system back up? I got it. But it is still disturbing to me some, some of what this means in terms of the implications. So think of a nuclear power plant. In the old model, four or five people were cleared and had badges and they had to go through a bunch of gates and get vetted to walk in to turn the knob that would move the reactor rods in and out. So the, the, the risk wasn't the only risk. I mean, if you built on a, a earthquake fault zone, there's another type of risk. But basically, you're talking about five people who physically have to be in the building to, to to move the controls in and out. The new world, if you get it wrong, how many people have wireless devices? Okay, laptops, PCs, what, a billion? And I'm, that's not, I'm including phones, right? You know, add however many other. So if you got the security wrong, we're talking a billion points of access anywhere in the world. You don't even need physical access. So what do you think the odds are that the risk profiles of those two are ever gonna be equivalent? Seriously? So, so I'm, again, I'm not saying wireless access bad. I'm saying there's a point where you can't get risk equivalence. And we ought to talk about that honestly. And I think that analogy kind of works, although it probably upsets a lot of people. So another way to sort of think differently, we need to think differently about security. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure that we have principled ways of talking about things, but not purist ways. You say, well, why were you telling me the world isn't perfect? I think we all know that. Because unfortunately, there seems to be a learning curve. We all go up, and I've gone up it, about purity versus pragmatism. Pragmatism doesn't mean sloppy. It means being targeted and understanding that we live in a world with constraints. So for example, um, sometimes when a researcher, and I, and I welcome researchers reporting vulnerabilities to us. We have a whole process for doing that, and we make sure we give people credit in our advisories. And generally, the rule in the com researcher community now seems to be you need to fix it in six months or we'll out it. But in the past, you've had to have, we've had to have dialogues with people say, you should fix this in three days. It's really serious. Well, OK, I understand it's serious. But I look at that and say, well, realize that we find 87% of vulnerabilities ourselves. Researchers find about 3%. Customers find about 10%. So we know about a whole lot more of the iceberg than you do. So I ask myself, OK, if we drop everything and do an emergency patch. We're taking scarce resources that are going toward fixing a bunch of other stuff, some of which may be more severe. And in some cases, we will do that. But customers, you know, the, the real metric here isn't how fast you can get the patch out. It's whether customers are protected or not. And they hate one-off patches. So I look at this and say, you know, it's, I kind of parody the MasterCard commercial. Two-line code change, 20 minutes. Finding the root cause, fixing it on all affected platforms and versions, Testing it against everything else that depends on it, six months. Three, giving customers a single patch that fixes a boatload of stuff that doesn't break anything priceless because they won't apply it if it, they think it's going to break something. So that's the difference between purist, yeah, yes, this is important, we should fix it, versus pragmatic. You know, if we did everything that way, 87% of issues wouldn't get touched at all because we're busy reacting. So we try to have that dialogue respectfully. But that's true in a lot of areas. You'd like to think in a perfect world you could do X, Y, and Z in security. And sometimes you find you come up against pragmatism. So principle is good. We should be principled. It's very important stuff. And pragmatism doesn't mean being sloppy. It means trying to come up with a principle at stake and being consistent in how you do that, even if it's not perfect. So, so how do we think differently? Um, it's enhanced by looking at other concepts and other disciplines, as I alluded to, some of which is economics. I'm going to spend more time on some of these than others just because I'm more conversant. And I came to this, A, by being a dilettante. I like lots of things. I'm not really good at any one thing. B, having had a strange background for security. I have an engineering degree, but it's not computer science or computer engineering. Mechanical engineering, uh, then I got an MBA. I was in the military, so I, I sort of think about things differently because I have a different background, but I also realized after, as I start reading in other areas how interesting some of these concepts are and how applicable they are to security. 
So economics seems, they, what do they call it? The, not the dismal science, maybe it is the dismal science. But it's really important. Economics rules the world. Everything you do has an economic impact or lack of economic impact. And so many of these concepts come to fore when we're talking about security. Now, I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking about the economics of things, how economics work. So for example, systemic risk. Most of us probably know what systemic risk is. Housing meltdown, right, 2008. Systemic risk, what they teach you in finance is some kinds of risks you can diversify. So for example, you have some stocks that go up under some conditions, some stocks go down in certain conditions, same conditions. So you get a balanced portfolio. You buy some that go up and some that go down so you don't have all your eggs in one basket and everything goes down at once. But you can't diversify market risk. The whole market tanks, you screwed. And unfortunately, the housing market was an example of systemic risk because of the interdependencies and the way that the, 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 the risks were loaded. So when, when one came off, they all came off. And so one of the things regulators try to do and we need to do, think about, is avoiding systemic risk. And that is my concern about putting so much stuff on the internet, because let's face it, the internet was not designed for some of these things. It was originally designed, a few academics, they know one another, let's share our research, let's make it easy. And it wasn't necessarily designed for what it's being used for now. And when you do things like, hey, let's put everybody's house on the internet, or let's make, put, put all these, everybody's, uh, I don't know, home refrigeration system on it. It wasn't designed for that, and I'm worried about creating systemic risk. We should have these discussions. It doesn't mean technology is bad, and it doesn't mean all advancements are bad. It means don't create that risk because you cannot, the only way to, to, to mitigate it is not to take the bet. And we need to have honest discussions. Instead, we get this worship of technology. Let's give missile batteries IP addresses because we can. What could go wrong? Um, the other one I talked about is efficient resource allocation. And, and this seems to be a strange notion to people, but time, money, and qualified people are always limited resource. It, it should be intuitive. So when somebody asks us to do things, I always think about, well, is this the most important thing we could be doing? And, and you sometimes have to have this discussion with regulators because, or, 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 or legislators, because they're saying, well, you know, we should do X, Y, and Z. I said, look, there are good things that are worth doing, and there are things that are worth doing more of, but you can't find the people to do them. So if you make me do something silly, it will crowd out more valuable work. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I, you can't make this stuff up. There was a proposal in a, a document that NIST put out. I have a lot of respect for NIST, so this is not denigrating them. But it was, the attempt was to reduce uh, supply chain risk and acquisition. Right? So one of the questions, they, things that they wanted was the acquirer should, should be notified whenever there's a personnel change involving maintenance. Okay, we have thousands of products. Every day somebody's checking code out and making a change and checking it back in. So almost every day somebody who didn't originate the code is making a change. I'm going to be tweeting you Day, you know, thousands, you know, gigabytes of information about, you know, Janie Sue checked out, checked out Joe Bob's code to make a change. What are you going to do with that? What problem is that going to solve? And we're a big company. We could probably do it if we had to. But, but what are you going to get for that? And it's going to crowd out more valuable work. And in some cases, the same people who are doing good things in security said, so do you want better code or not? Because the people are going to do better stuff can get on with it, and if they're busy reporting this stuff, those are the same people that would be making our products better. So you're going to have an unintended consequences because it's going to crowd out more valuable work. Uh, opportunity cost is another one. So occasionally when I hear people talk about economics, they have the, this pitch about vendors are evil slugs and they build crappy code because they don't care and it's cheaper for them. I said, no, no, it's not cheaper at all to do it that way. First of all, anybody of any size runs their own business on it, so you're, you're poisoning yourself. But second of all, it costs a lot of money to do one-off patches. It is so much cheaper to build it right the first time. So it, the money that we have tied up in producing patches, which we have to do to support our customers, as do all large vendors, you could take those same resources and build something you could charge money for. Well, businesses are economically incented, right? We'd much rather build something new and innovative than fix old defects. So you actually do have a good incentive to get it right the first time. Surprisingly as that sounds, but the, again, it's a very high opportunity cost. Not to mention, no customer ever calls me up and says, you know, I'm so bored this week, I don't have any patches to apply. Don't you have more patches for me? No, they don't, we don't have those discussions. 
And you don't either as users, right? Nobody wants to upgrade their system. I want something that works that I don't have to touch for the next 25 years, ideally. Uh, market signaling is another thing, you know, the way that markets signal one another what's going on. So, for example, and this actually has changed since I've been working in security and particularly in the assurance area, the um, large customer sectors, financial services is one of them, and the government sector have signaled their, their suppliers very strongly, look, we need you to build better software. We need you to do a better job here. It's really important. National security issues, you've got to do a better job. And, and markets respond to that. Um, and I won't talk about moral hazard. I'll just skip that one. Other thing, game theory. Game theory is really interesting. Uh, there's a great book called The Prisoner's Dilemma about how game theory influenced the Cold War. I recommend it. It's fascinating. But one of the things you know, they, they talk about is um, there's a little thing called The Prisoner's Dilemma. Basically, you're, you're caught with a henchman, and you're accused of a crime, and if you both hang tight and don't rat out on the other one, you'd be in a better position, but there's, a, there's an incentive to defect and sell your buddy down the river because you know, he'll get the jail time or she will, and you won't. So let's talk about how to, not only how do people behave, but how do people behave in groups. And there actually is an example of this in security, for, for example, and there are probably other examples, but one of them is um, vendors are getting increasingly asked to get, you know, get, give source code to a government or a third party and have them scan it for vulnerabilities. There are all kinds of reasons this is actually a very bad idea. I did a seven-page document about why it's bad from a public policy standpoint. But you'd think that one vendor would defect because, hey, if I give, give my code to country X, I can sell more stuff there. Except, so that seems like a, 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 an incentive to defect, except right now we're all hanging tight. I don't know anybody, big ones, who agreed to do this. There are all kinds of reasons why they wouldn't. IP theft is one of them. Um, the difficulties of it, the concern that somebody would use that to find a zero day they exploit for national security purposes. There are all kinds of reasons we don't want to agree to this, but thus far, it's kind of like what Ben Franklin said before the revolution. Gentlemen, we must all hang together. We, we shall surely all hang separately. So at least in, in this case, people do recognize you know, holding the line. Uh, biology. This would be really interesting to apply to uh, systems. It turns out that trees that are under attack, say by pine beetles or some type of a parasite, they signal one another. They send out chemical signals to the trees around them to raise their chemical defenses. So the, pine, the big bad pine beetle is coming to get you. Raise your defenses to try to prevent that. What if our systems could sort of do the same thing? That they know that they're under attack and they can notify other nodes in the network and the nodes in the network could, could elevate their defenses more automatically. That would be really interesting. Somebody should figure that out. Deception. Why do we have honey pots? They're already, we already have examples of that in cybersecurity of using things that are deceptive to lure the predator, not to get you, but to see what the predator is doing and get the predator bogged down somewhere else so they won't actually attack your real systems. But the big one that I find really informative is sort of military strategy and tactics. And I will give you a bunch of examples in that area. And you're going to wonder, why am I going off on this tangent? The military, uh, the Defense Department is an extreme example, maybe not so extreme, of what most companies are trying to do. As I said, IT is infrastructure now. It's also infrastructure for businesses. You know, everybody has an IT lifeblood. You know, they're trying to be you know, better, smart, faster, smarter, have more information about their business. And, and so they're trying to take these systems and get information out as quickly as possible. With, the, with regard to the Defense Department, it's very simple. They are um, information-centric now. Information is seen as a um, force multiplier. We don't need as many people or ships and planes because we have better information, so we can make target our weapons better. So the way they do this is to say, you know, we're going to take all these disparate systems. So if I get a really cool piece of intelligence, instead of waiting three weeks to declassify it and we'll sneak or net it across and put a tape in another system and have them declassify, I'm going to want to get that, that out to the warfighter in real time in the battle space as fast as I can because then information has the time to live. But in order to do this, it means that you're going to have to glue a bunch of networks together that didn't used to be glued together. And th there's robust reasons to do this to make that warfighter more effective, but there are also certain risks associated with it. This is the Wikipedia uh, definition. And my biggest concern about this is think about this. We're using information as, as an element of war to be smarter and better when we fight, but it means that the network itself now has become the battlefield. The network itself is something that you have to defend, otherwise your ability to use that information is going to be greatly diminished. Um, 
And it, and again, you know, it, it eliminates a lot of the natural defensive boundaries that networks have. Networks that are not physically connected have a, there's gonna be less infiltration, all things being equal. Although perhaps Stuxnet put the lie to that. Um, but it does it force you to defend the entire network. And, and then I have a question about what is that Isfahan, Luana, or Rourke's Drift? You're saying, what the heck is that? What does that have to do with anything? There are a couple of really famous battles. There are movies about them. Uh, Zulu is one of them, and I think Zulu Dawn that talks about the, the Zulu War, the, um, the Zulu War in the 19th century. And the British had one total disaster found, found, followed it almost a day later by a really good uh, defense. And Isan Luana, they had really done dumb things. They, they had uh, too, too porous a perimeter, and all their uh, ammunition was in the interior, so they just couldn't get the bullets to fight. But basically, they, they didn't do what they, their standard practice was. They were just overrun and just murdered. And Rourke's Drift, and it was a bunch of engineers, it was completely indefensible. It was like a hospital and a but they created not only a perimeter, but they created interior perimeters. They used, um, not sandbags, forget what they were, but, but, but effectively, if they got overrun, they had a place to fall back to, so that it's something that could be de defended. And that they should have just been annihilated, but they weren't because of the way that they created these defensive positions. There's 11 Victoria Crosses. So, but that's my point here. If you can't defend everything. You can't defend every element of your network. You have to have things that are fallback positions or redoubts, I think the military engineers would say. And the other part of this is the more, as I said, the more that war fighting has an IT backbone, the network itself becomes what you have to defend. So, so the United States, and I'm not trying to be US-centric here. I know we probably have a, a, a multinational audience, but the US has is, is got, great weaponry. A lot of other people are not going to be able to, to match the United States in terms of the armaments. But if I can deny use the use of those armaments by futzing with them, that's a technical term, be, then, you know, so what that you have a, a, an arms advantage? If I can make you distrust the information that you're relying on, again, information-centric warfare, those drones are being piloted by somebody in Tampa. If I can deny you that intelligence, if I can make you suspect it because I've corrupted it, either deny you access or corrupt it so you cannot rely on it, you cannot use that information as a force multiplier. You screwed. So again, I, if I can deny you the fruits of your technology, you know, I, I won't say I win, but at least you don't. So that's kind of interesting. I think they realize that. So what is the or taint it. And the other thing, I think, I don't know if it was Woody Allen who said 90% of life is showing up. No, 90% of life is solving the right problem. So one of the right problems to solve that I have concerns about when I talk to people in the government, I have great respect as a COTS provider, commercial off the shelf, for the, 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 the good stuff you can get now off the shelf. You don't have to build yourself anymore. That's great. But COTS is not well suited for everything. I think we can all say that, right? There's, it's general purpose software, it's very good but that doesn't mean it's good for everything. And unfortunately, I feel like people buy things off the shelf without always thinking about the threat environment that it's gonna go in, and that's really important. How is that important? Another analogy. Um, there's some really good squirt guns on the market. You have a nasty little brother, you can get a super soaker and really take them out. My big brother, actually, that's what I used on him, ha. But it's not good for all threat environments, so I don't care how good a super soaker you have, you, if an integrator buys a super soaker and sprinkles their little pixie dust on it and hands it to the Marines and says, hey, it's an M4 on the battlefield, trust me, it's going to be an M4, those Marines are going to get annihilated. And you think, well, that's a silly example. What, what does the squirt gun have to do with it? You know what? Squirt gun is not an M4, and this is also true in software and hardware. You can get very good stuff off the shelf. That does not mean it was designed for all threat environments. And that is one of the issues I am concerned about in, in regardless of what people are buying. Do you know that it was designed for your threat environment? Because if it wasn't, it's probably not going to... It might work in your threat environment, but it might not be the best solution for you. So another problem, we're going to defend the network. What, one of the problems, this is getting a little better, I think, is situ, what the military calls situational awareness. Think about knowing what's, that's a fancy term for knowing what's going on. Okay, who's on my network? Can anybody answer this question in real time right now? Who's on my network? What's on my network? What is my state of readiness? I mean, are all my systems patched? Are they all configured properly? Who, what's coming over the hill? If you can't answer that real time, it's very hard to defend what you have. 
Advantage goes to the attacker, and it usually does. That's why they're so stealthy. Most people don't knock on the front door anymore and say, hi, I'm running a port scan. I'm just trying to get into your network. They try to find much more stealthy ways in. So that's, that's a problem. OK, well, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, but I will come back to the military thing. So now I thought about thinking about differently, thinking about how you design, what kind of threats you have, how you express them, what type of analogies you can use. There's a lovely phrase, fancy, fancy schmancy, use Latin, sid sibi pacem parabellum, if you would have peace, prepare for war. If we're going to build systems that are infrastructure, that are going to be attacked, um, that need to have reasonably defensive perimeters, we need to sort of think about building them differently because we don't always build them that way. And part of this has to do with the who builds. Who, who builds? who builds it? How are we building the builders? And what we build? I could also say where in the sense I talked about systemic risk. There's a lovely phrase in the New Testament. Who knew it was a cybersecurity manual about the, the wise and the foolish builder and the foolish builder builds on sand. So we shouldn't be building on technical sand. So who we build, this is one of the right problems to solve. And I've been whining about this for years. I'd love to think it's better, and maybe it is slightly better, but we're not there yet. Part of the problem, back to my little Dutch boys, is the people who build these systems don't have a lot of basic security, smarts, and education, and mindset. And it's not because computer science uh, graduates are stupid. Far from it. I work with really brilliant people, but they didn't get anything about security. You could certainly start this earlier. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, clicking on any attachment from somebody in Nigeria who's offering to give you some money is probably not a good idea. But, uh, but also, particularly in the universities, the curricula really has got to change. I, I'm, I'm just appalled that, that people with PhDs from, from well-known schools, name one, don't understand this stuff at a basic level because they were never taught it, not because they're stupid. Um, they don't understand they're building infrastructure, that it's going to be attacked, it's probably going to be successful in some cases, and that security is really you know, an element, in fact, it's a mindset of what they have to be building. Just like in the engineering schools know this, if you are a civil engineer, you have to take a structures class, and you, it built, it literally the class, the rest of the class is built on that. You don't get to opt out of structures. Oh, structures, that was so two semesters ago, I don't have to worry about that anymore. No, 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 your, your bridge literally still depends on your knowledge of structures. And the same thing needs to be true in computer science, computer engineering, and so on and so forth. And so all the vendors, I've had this discussion with my peers at Cisco and Microsoft, and we all have to teach basic secure coding, secure development, secure mindset 101 to really smart young people. And they, they should, really should have learned it. And part of the reason is, again, self, enlightened self-interest. We spend a lot of money fixing avoidable defects in software. But it isn't just the coding errors, right? You can, we have tools that find some of that stuff. It's, it's really the mindset. In the past, when we've had uh, development areas that we, we call, I call lovingly problem children, they were having, struggling with security, maybe we're getting a lot of researcher found vulnerabilities. The, always the biggest problem, I always go to one of the EVP, executive vice president, and say, you know what? Fundamentally, it's a cultural issue. My team will put skin in it, we'll put our hackers on it, there are all kinds of good things we can do, but at some point, every one of these developers needs to understand he or she is personally responsible for this code. Personally responsible, it's not the QA's team, it's not the hacker's job, it's not my job. If they don't get that, we're gonna fail. Really, really need to get that. It's a mindset. And frankly, as I mentioned, the little Dutch boys, we need better cyber engineers, not just cyber SEALs. Um, yeah, we're always going to need to have attackers and defenders, and I got that. It's a, it's a budding career, but it's always easier to be an attacker than a defender. And it still means that we need to build much more defensible systems, more robust, more defensible, because we shouldn't need so many defenders. And frankly, we're going to fail there. It's the same thing. You're not going to have enough fingers to go in the holes in the dike if you don't make sure the dams are built better. So how do we do that? Frankly, any, any CS program she needs to change their curriculum, and they, it, security is not taking a class on how Kerberos works. It's embedding this within every single class. And I know this works because, um, actually somebody at Stanford did this. They were red teaming and blue teaming everybody's homework so people could attack one another's code. That was, and that wasn't a, even a security class. But I know this works because, oops, technical difficulties. I can see mine, maybe somebody can fix this. Anyway. Um, I went to the University of Virginia, and they have a humanities division in the engineering school, as strange as that sounds, because they thought one of the important things was technologists should be able to communicate. So every class that you had that had a written component, a lab that you had to write up, 
Half of your grade was from the English department. It had to do with thesis. Half your grade was from the English department. They kept building on those communication skills, reinforcing that it's part of what you have to know as a, as a toolie, and you were graded on it. So guess what? It doesn't mean we were, anybody was going to be uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald when they got out of uh, undergraduate. Frankly, if you're a scientist, you don't really want to write fiction anyway, right? But they made sure that we could communicate well, and it was a reinforced skill. So computer uh, security in computer science and engineering needs to be exactly the same. There we go. So I'm going to return to my military theme here. Let's see what time we are. Make sure I'm not. Okay, good. We've still got time. So how do we build differently? I talked about who we build. We need to make sure that the builders themselves are educated to think differently. But what we build needs to be a little bit differently, too. It needs to be different. And a couple things I could come up with. Um, I was a naval officer in a previous life, not a member of the Marine Corps. I always tell people, you know, there's no such thing as an ex-Marine. They're former Marines. They're very proud of that. But the Marines are lethal, and they're lethal for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that they, uh, well, first of all, they don't assume they're never going to get attacked and never take casualties. And they also understand what it, the difference, what is strategic to defend. Um, and back to my analogy example, uh, years ago at Oracle, I was trying to convince an executive that there was an important technology area in security that we needed to own. I said, if we don't own that for the enterprise, then all the rest of the stuff we build, like database security, won't matter. I said, it's like the Marines took Henderson Field on Guadalcanal, and that's what they held, not the whole, and he got it because he was a Marine. The development manager didn't understand what I was talking about, but the executive got it immediately. So anyway, you, you, you defend what is strategic, not try to defend everything. And the Marines have an ethos. Every Marine a rifleman. That means no matter what you do, whether you're uh, a clerk, whether you're, whatever your job is, you're first and foremost a rifleman. That means every Marine can self-defend. They get overrun. No one's going to say, excuse me, you, Mr. Bad Guy, don't shoot me. See the guy over there? That's the one with the rifle. That's the person you need to be attacking, every single one of them. And so I look at that and say, why can't we build network components the same way? Why can't every product be smart enough to understand when it's under attack and defend itself? You shouldn't need to have 52 different, you know, okay, I've got, I've got N nodes of a network. I cannot have N firewalls out there or N defenders. And yes, I understand a lot of them do load balancing, all this stuff. But the point is, why do I need them at all? If, it, if a product should be smart enough, it understands, okay, I know what good input is. I know what bad input is. Bad input, it doesn't understand evil input at all in most cases. Okay, I'm going to try to type in 260,000 X's to see if I can get the stack to fall over. But bad input and evil input are actionable intelligence. So it ought to be smart enough to say, you know what, I'm under attack here, and I'm going to raise my defenses. I don't need some network administrator to come in and retwiddle the bits here, because by that time it's too late. The attacks are automated. So why can't we build our systems to be, you know, every Marine is a rifleman. Everyone can defend. Now, granted, you're probably not going to counterattack somebody, but you should at least be able to defend yourself. Uh, again, self-aware networks. Um, I talked a little bit about the situational awareness. I have to uh, say that there, there actually is some good work going on in this. Uh, uh, I see Bob Martin back there. There has been actually a lot of good work that's gone on in MITRE and among government entities to try to say, yeah, we understand this problem. We're trying to make it simpler for it to have basic stuff called SCAP, which I think security content automation protocol, is that right? Basic things like, okay, what, what products are you running? What version is it? What's your patch level? Uh, what's your configuration? So that more of this stuff can be automated so you can get to what's on my network, who's on my network, what's happening, um, and, and that's all to the good. The more that we can automate some of this, you will at least have the situational awareness and that means that you're going to be better able to know, you know, hey, there's something out of whack here. You know, that system's uh, security um, knobs were tweaked. They're out of alignment. Uh, or we're under attack. Can we move them to another level? Again, with all due respect to SIM vendors, uh, they can't correlate data that doesn't exist. So if the network components don't actually audit anything, they don't keep logs, they're not in some format that are understandable, the, the value add that the SIM vendors is really the, the intelligence to analyze that. It's not hoovering all these records up and trying to translate from, I don't know, Hawaiian into uh, Hebrew, not that that can't be done. Um, making, oh, sorry. 
The other thing, and the, I think the government probably is going to get there because I, I suspect that this S cap will be pushed out more and more as a requirement. Um, I would like to see it be more like an ISO standard. Thank you. Um, the government actually does enforce standards sometimes as a public good. And I'll give you an example. The Transcontinental Railroad. The reason that there's a standard train gauge in the United States, I think four feet, I want to say four feet eight and one half inch, is because prior to that, the railroad lines couldn't connect. They physically couldn't connect because there were different gauges. You'd get off the you know, B&O railroad, and step off, and you'd step onto another one because the trains couldn't meet. They were different gauges until the U.S. government stepped in and said, we're going to build a transcontinental railroad, and it means that we'll tell you what the train gauge is going to be, four feet eight and one half inches. Um, or we'll find other ways to do this. And I think it will take a large customer base like the U.S. government to say, you know what, enough with you guys futzing around with this. We're going to tell you what it is. Although I have to say, as long as you're back there, it would be nice if this were an ISO standard, then it would be easier. But that could enable dynamic redoubts. Back to my, uh, my military history examples. If you had this kind of awareness and you automated knowing what's out there, including what your security settings are, you could more easily dynamically respond when you know that you are under attack because it would be automatable. Say, oh, you know what? I'm going to raise my defenses now. Something bad's happening instead of waiting for an administrator to do it. A couple more. Search and oh, just a couple of seconds of this. Half the problems that enterprises have is they have data in too many places and they don't know where it is. So if you had a more innovative way, for example, search and destroy engine, why can't you go out and find out where all this data is in your network and, if appropriate, nuke it? Or why couldn't we have data that has a time to live? Even if it's just something as simple as there's a lawsuit, a lot of people will settle those because discovery will kill you. Going out and finding all these records as opposed to having a few well-kept records in a central place. So if you had the ability to say, get rid of stuff you don't need in a more automated way that would certainly make your business run more efficiently, but also mean there'd be less stuff out there to steal. And one last thing, and I think I can take some questions. And the last thing is, is really interesting, and I keep thinking there's got, somebody brilliant will come up with a way to apply this. There's a wonderful um, guy who changed warfare named, uh, I think, Major John Boyd. He actually figured why do fighter, some fighter pilots win in, in a dogfight, and it had to do with something called agility, basically. So he came up with this thing called OODA, Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. And the gist of it is, if you can, can um, make decisions faster and keep your, your other, the other guy off balance, if, in other words, if you're more agile, you're going to prevail in warfare. And this got adopted by a lot of other people. The Marines used it in the first Gulf War very successfully. Businesses have adopted this. So I look at this and say, could you apply this to our networks? If you could find a way to, in a way, literally keep your opponent off balance in some way through more dynamic configurations, you could at least prevail. You're not going to go back and attack them, but at least you could prevail as a defender. Somebody's got to find a way to do this. So last thing, and I'll take questions. So I'm, again, I'm, I just want to kind of recap this. There are all kinds of interesting technologies coming out now, and I'm not saying any of these are bad or they're bad ideas or being the l perpetual Luddite. But I do think about, and I'm sure there are much smarter people looking at what can go wrong with some of these things. So just to put my little evil hat on, driverless cars coupled with GPS systems. You know, why would I bother to blow somebody's car up? I'll just hack into the system, target their specific car, and get that car to crash. Why wouldn't I do that if I'm evil-minded? Electronic medical records have already had hacked. So okay, again, what could possibly go wrong? Why don't, you know that allergy you had to penicillin? I'm just going to make that go away. So I'm not saying any things are bad. I'm saying a lot of people building these systems don't necessarily think about, again, what could possibly go wrong. Giving missile batteries IP addresses. Not a good idea. And then we're talking about this. And my last comment, what is childproof hand grenades? Some of the discussions I think we have in security kind of devolve to this. Well, we have this thing that's very, you know, kind of risky. So let's, let's think of a way we have a hand grenade so that a Marine can pull the pin easily, but a three-year-old child can't, and we'll make sure we design it. I'm thinking, you know, the answer to that problem isn't technology. It's making sure the hand grenade doesn't get anywhere near a three-year-old. It's pretty simple. So and don't solve some of these technical problems when the answer is keep the dang hand grenade out of the hands of the three-year-old. We shouldn't even be having that discussion. Okay, uh, quick summary, and I'll take questions. So again, 
90% of life is solving the right problem. And I think one of the right problems is just changing the way that we do things, changing our builders, changing uh, the mindsets, changing when we talk about it, particularly being able to use analogies so that the decision makers actually understand the risk. It can't just be, you know, I had this discussion with a developer one time. I said, you know, we need an ITP store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we need an SITP. Yeah, yeah, what's that? I said, Internet Toaster Protocol. I was just trying to see if the guy was, knew what I was talking about or just going to take any technical battle I threw out there. Um, it, it requires us to actually become more dilettantes, to think about some of these other areas so that we can draw in these analogies, we can think, use other ways of thinking about things to express ourselves, and poten potentially you know, build more defensible systems. So that's all I had, and I'm happy to take questions. I think we've got about four minutes, maybe. Yes, in the back. I, I want to restate the question, make sure I understand it. Uh, how we could make um, applications themselves more aware. Uh, I haven't, I, I saw some blurblet someplace about somebody doing some research on that area. I, I'm still working on kind of, you know, problem A, which is I want the code itself to be more uh, resilient, but we do have requirements for auditing as part of our secure code, uh, code standards. But that's actually interesting. I wonder if I can get some, that's a good idea. I think I'll get some of our brilliant minds in one of our lab areas to go look at this. Is there something we could do more generically that would make those products more self-aware? That's a great idea. I mean, I talked this and said, well, Marianne, why don't you go off and do that? Hmm, maybe I should. So I think, I think I'll take that as a takeaway. I'm so down in the weeds, I forget that sometimes we're trying to plant sequoias, but maybe it's time to go plant a sequoia. Another question? Yes. Uh, sorry, the uh, question is, what, what's my experience talking to developers about security? Well, they sort of don't have a choice. Um, we, we have a, we have a, as many other vendors do now, we have a, a formal, that's why, you know, saying, why are you talking about this stuff? Aren't you the network person? Actually, I'm not. I don't have responsibility for securing our networks. I have wonderful colleagues who do that. My remit is actually product security. And of that, it's really assurance. So we have a program, uh, Oracle uh, Software Security Assurance, uh, that basically kind of drills into people. Okay, we have coding standards. We don't expect you to memorize 600 pages, so you know what, well, here's a, here are a couple of training classes. We have requirements to use automated tools. We have requirements when we uh, a ship product, there's certain checklists they have to go through to make sure they did the right thing. So we're, we score ourselves against that, and we continue to try to raise the bar on that, but, but it's not optional. And, and we do find groups that are maybe through acquisition or, or now there's another part of the company I want to apply that to. So, so I, I will not tell you that everybody immediately says, great, let me get the security tattoo. I'll sing the company security song. We do have pockets of resistance, but it's kind of not optional. We, can, we can't afford to have it be optional because customers are expecting us to do our jobs. And it, it, the, frankly, the brand damage, it's not just the cost. You know, we, again, it's very expensive to produce patches, but the brand damage because people expect better from us is, is really terrible and should be. You know, so look, we expect better from you. And we run our own business on our products, so if we screw it up, we are the first ones to suffer. That's another good incentive to get it right. Uh, yeah, well, we're not perfect, nobody is, but um, I'm, very, I'm very pleased to say that I don't get yelled at by my management for being um, over-enthusiastic about this. The management is really supportive of this. In fact, usually if I can't get somebody to do the right thing, I said, you don't want to listen to me, you're really not going to want to hear what my boss has to say. And usually when people get a weapon, then they get it. Yes. Um, I do understand that, and I will tell you that we had, I, I, I made a flippant comment, which fortunately I didn't make publicly, and I won't tell you what product it was. It was like, well, anybody who uses that in a SCADA system deserves what happened to them, and I, I really was very flippant. And then somebody told me, well, you know, it actually is using SCADA. So I said, oh, okay, great. I'm glad you told me that, and we, we actually did go back to that team and say, okay, I didn't know it was used like that. We now have a higher duty of care, and we put them on kind of the fast track. And part of that was my fear that I had no idea people were using it for that. I was shocked that people were, but now that I know that, I can't just go back and tell the people who are doing that, well, you know, you made a mistake there. You shouldn't be doing that. 
it's too late. So I had to, we had to up our game. So, so I don't know what the answer is. Again, I try to educate policymakers. Look, guys, I'm not telling you COPS is bad. It's very good. It's very good general purpose. The bar keeps going to raise, but it's not, it's like, you know, my, my super soaker is pretty dang good, but it is not an M4. So you have to really think about this as part of acquisition. If you don't think about this, it, you're going to continue to have problems. You cannot use this for all purposes. On the other side, I do try to be more aware of how it's certain components being used and, and up our game anyway. It may not be high assurance, it's not gonna be an A1 system to use the old orange book things, but we, you can make it, you know, as, as, as we wanna push the boundaries of commercial software because people expect that. And it's, it's a scarier world than it was when I started working in this area. All right, zero, we're out of time. Thank you very much, appreciate your attention.